Uh, we're in a series um, on suffering setbacks, uh, on surviving setbacks, on, on the Job training, on the job training, on the Job training. Job has legendary status as a righteous sufferer. Um, we don't know much about him, really. Um, what we know is that um, he lived a righteous life. He was a, he lived at the time where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived. He lived before Moses, before the Israelites went to Egypt, before they met with God on Mount Sinai, before David and Solomon and the prophets. He lived a long time ago, probably around 1800 BC, something like that. Um, he was a righteous man. He was a, a consummate righteous man he, in family values. He, uh, his, he has a great family, has seven sons, three daughters. They care for one another very deeply. In fact, his sons, they have seven of them, they gave a feast every night. And every, all the family came. He was a righteous man in that he was very protective of his children. He wanted them to have a good time. But what he would do then on the end of the week was he would offer a sacrifice in case his family did something that was not good in the eyes of God and he would hopefully cover up for some of their transgressions. Cared a lot about his family, was a righteous man, um, not just in terms of family values, but in terms of social involvement. He was the best of Republicans and Democrats. He was purple. He was actively involved in reaching out and caring about those who were oppressed, those who had less than him. Very wealthy, but gave a lot of it away. Never saw a stranger that he didn't take in. Never anyone in the public square that was homeless that he didn't reach out to. Um, he lived a righteous life, and yet he endured great suffering. And that's what we'll find this morning as we trace the story a little bit that he suffered setbacks and survived them. And therefore, he has a lot to teach us about surviving setbacks, about surviving setbacks. And that's why we call this on the Job training. We're going to try to learn from him over the course of the next five weeks. When we experience turnabouts, turnarounds, setbacks in our jobs or in our family, or in our health. How can you survive that type of stuff, especially as you think of trying to relate to God? Because here's the problem. If you're trying to be the person that God wants you to be, now none of us are perfect, but the fact that you're here, the fact that you care means that you, like me, we're out there swinging. You know, we're not, we, we don't do our best all the time, but we're trying to figure the God thing out. We're trying to walk with him as best we can, and we're trying to be righteous people. And I know some of you would say, I don't, you don't know me. And uh, boy, you don't. You know, I know we all struggle. But, you know, to the best that we can, we're trying to live a godly life. And yet we suffer. And those things, when you put those together, they create real problems because we end up with questions that, that cause trust in God to be difficult to, to be able to put our arms around. In fact, it creates a crisis of faith. And that's kind of what we'll see this morning. We don't have a problem when somebody who does something wrong gets what they deserve. I was home over the holidays, got to be home for a week. My family in that area uh, they feel very strongly that we shouldn't have been in Iraq, never should have been. I don't know how you feel about that. Um, but there's not many people that would not agree that we're not really sad to see Saddam Hussein gone when we hear about some of the accounts of the atrocities that, that he caused, uh, the, you know, the terrible things that were done to people, and this was just a little snapshot of what he did in just one experience. When we see somebody get what they deserve, it doesn't cause a disconnect, does it, for us? You know, there's a sense that, boy, you know, I tell you what, whatever goes wrong comes around. However, it's a different thing when someone gets what they don't deserve, and we, no, or we have been people, even though we've been trying the best we can, have endured suffering. When something bad happens to someone good, or something good happens to someone bad, that creates a disconnect for us. It's kind of like if there's a God in heaven, 
How can I believe in a God who lets bad things happen to good people or good things happen to bad people? That's some of the things that we deal with when we come into the book of Job, a legendary sufferer. Uh, look at your worship folder and let's trace what happened to this guy. In the first chapter of the book that bears his name, uh, here's what we read. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the older brother's, oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabaeans attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked will I depart. The Lord God, the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. We've left out a character that we'll talk about next week and the week after, Satan. We're just looking at what happens to Job, but we do read here about his involvement, um, because as we'll see, it's a result of a dialogue between him and God that all these things are happening. And the reason why we're leaving it out is because Job doesn't know it. He never finds out. So as far as, as we are on Job's level, all we know is that one day he's going about his business, being a righteous person, living a good life, taking care of his family, giving to those in need, and a servant comes your flocks are dead and your servants have been killed. While that one goes, another one comes, your family is gone. And he experiences this, shaves his head, and then what we hear is that Satan and God have another discussion and now we pick up what happens. This is the third strike. Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Remarkable character. Up to this point, things for Job, he has the ability to endure Incredible suffering, and that's why he has legendary status as such, like an icon. Uh, and then, as we'll see in upcoming weeks, some individuals come to discuss faith issues with him. They said, let's talk about and try to apply faith in God to what you're experiencing. And that's where the trouble begins. And that's where the questions come, and they revolve around these things. These questions come in a time of suffering. Now, if you don't care about God, then these questions won't be as haunting. If you care about God, these questions are choking. They're squeezing, and you can't get away from them. They are, is God good? Again, I'm speaking in the context of suffering. When we experience things, be it in the job, or in the family, or with our health, is God good? And the reason why that's a relevant question is, well, if he's good, why is he allowing bad things to happen? And that's a question that squeezes and chokes, followed up by another one, is God strong? It might be that God is good, but not strong, that he doesn't want bad things to happen, but he's not strong enough to prevent them. But then you see where that question's going to go. Well, what, is, what good is it to be God then? I mean, if he doesn't have the power to prevent a, a turnabout in a job or to prevent a disease, in fact, he can do that. Jesus did it. You know, so is he good? Is he strong? And if God is good, and if he is strong, then in suffering, here comes the third question, am I bad? That's the logical conclusion. If God is strong and if he's good and I am suffering, then what does that leave? I must deserve this. 
I must deserve this. And that's what ends up happening in the dialogue with, with Job's friends. They end up bringing that point to bear. And, and that causes Job some problems. That's where a crisis of faith comes from. And Job was able to survive. He was a one that, that wouldn't fold. So he was willing to admit, is God good? Yes. Is God strong? Yes. Am I bad? Job says, no, I'm not bad. That's the problem. You know, there is, you know, I'm a perfect. And Job wasn't a perfect person. But his phenomenal suffering wasn't tied to phenomenal sin. Understand that? You look at things you're experiencing. We have the capacity in us, or there's some kind of automatic deduction that, well, if, if I am experiencing this bad stuff, it's because I've done something bad that makes me deserve this bad stuff. But would, and they were telling Job that, but Job said, Tide, that's not true. That's not true. I'm suffering phenomenal suffering, but I didn't do phenomenal sin. This book is about Job, but the book that bears his name that's in the Bible, it wasn't written by Job. It wasn't written, but in fact, it was written sometime, probably around a thousand years later. The story of Job was passed on orally from person to person, generation to generation. Lived at the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and sometime, about a thousand years after he lived, probably, in the reign of Solomon, when a lot of literature, poetry, and wisdom literature, somebody sat down and took this, we don't even know who, and penned the book of Job. So we have who wrote the book? We don't know. We don't know. We do know that he was Jewish, somebody who was a Jew, part of the nation of Israel. At the time, we know that because of the, the name he gives to God. He calls God by the Jewish name for God, Jehovah, Yahweh. So he was a Jew. We know that. We know that he was a man acquainted with God because his writing shows deep experience with God and all the things and all the truths that people teach about God, how God does this and that and why he does this and that. So he's a man acquainted with God and obviously a man acquainted with suffering because the, the focus is on God, but it also gives us an up-close and personal experience of the kind of thoughts that haunt the mind of a sufferer. And he knows Job's mind too well to be a person who's unacquainted with suffering. I talked to a counselor once, and this individual said that he can tell after three or four minutes with a, in a conversation with a person whether they've experienced suffering or not, deep suffering. Somebody who suffers has a depth to them. There's something deep about them. They have been forced inside by suffering. And therefore, this individual knows too much about suffering to, he must have been acquainted with it. He's acquainted with the impact of ill-advised God talk. You know what God talk is. Blah, 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 God talk. God talk, blah, blah, blah. Stuff that might sound good, pat answers, trite platitudes and he's heard all of this stuff and he knows the ill-advised impact of that type of talk maybe from people who are well-meaning who are coming along sufferers and are trying to tell them God things, God talk, but it's not helping the situation at all. And that's what we know about this guy. He knows about God, he knows about suffering and it really irks him, I think to see the impact of religious people coming alongside sufferers and telling them things that make their load heavier. I'd like to meet this guy. We don't know who he is, but he sounds like an interesting guy to me. Who wrote the book and why did he tell this story? I think it's because he saw good things happening to bad people and bad things happening to good people. You know, if we live in a glass bubble, we might believe that God rewards the righteous and he punishes the unrighteous. And that's not true. Not as far as now is concerned. You say that never to know. It is true. But there's plenty of indications in cases where good things happening to bad people, bad things happening to good people. And this guy wrote this book because he saw this. He also was acquainted with 
the pat answers and trite platitudes that the religious tell those who are suffering. And he saw that as well, being a religious person. Why he wrote this book, I think a third thing is that he was sick of it. Sick of it. I am sick and tired of seeing people who are suffering and have religious people come alongside them, tell them things that might sound good to the religious person, but as far as the impact on the sufferer, it's doing them no good at all. I am sick of it because suffering is not neat and clean. It's not, you did a bad thing, God does a bad thing to you. This guy says, I am sick of this. I'm going to tell you a story about a sufferer who was a righteous man who suffered greatly. Why? Because we need to sever the connection between you did something bad, something bad happens to you. It's just not that easy. Is it? Is it? Just not that easy. You know, we, we might try to understand some things about God and say, I know how, but, but there's some big questions about God. Why does he allow good things to happen to bad people and bad things to happen to good people? You know what the answer is? There's not a clear, firm, direct answer. And that's what this guy ends up saying. And he writes it to kind of contradict those who have neat little formulas. It's God does this, one, two, three, four, five, and then you get this. What this guy says is that is not the truth. I like this guy, by the way. <laughs> really like this guy. Um, here's his message to those whose attempt to defend God burdened sufferers. Ready? Here's his, here's his message. Shut up! I think that's it. His message to those whose attempt to defend God burdened sufferers. He says, shut up! You're doing more harm than help. Joe Bailey in the book of View from a Hearse, um, talks about losing both of his sons in an accident and having to sit there and be in the hearse, knowing that the hearse is carrying his two sons, talks about an occasion where he was sitting down and individuals came to him. There was a woman who came and talked about how God is good and all the good things God does and how he makes the flowers and makes the clouds. And, and Joe Bailey said, I couldn't wait for her to leave. Another person came and talked about, well, God has chosen you to accomplish this great mission. Boy, he must have real big things in mind for you because he chose you for this special mission to suffer this special thing. He couldn't wait for that person to leave. Other people were a little bit uncomfortable. They might have felt that, yeah, I don't know what you did, Joe, but, and, you know, that didn't work. There was one person who sat quietly, didn't feel the need to defend God, say a lot of things to explain it, just sat quietly, asked him, Joe, can I pray for you? Prayed simply. And what did Joe Bailey says in his book? I hated to see that person leave. Sometimes we want to have all these explanations, and that's what these individuals will meet who come alongside Job. And this writer is familiar with the kind of dialogue, the kind of things that were said to sufferers by the religious. And that is, it sounds a little harsh, shut up, but I, I put that for a reason. I think that's what he says. Be quiet. Be quiet. It's a serious thing to claim to speak for God. It's a serious thing when you think of it. It's a serious thing to claim to speak for God, to talk to someone who's suffering and to say, here's how God works. That's a really, really serious thing. Uh, when we reduce God to formulas, it leaves the sufferer in more of a bind. In fact, it neutralizes God's help. Now, do we need, can we speak about God? Yeah, we need to speak about God. But what I'm saying is the things we say about God, they better not be half-baked. The truer we express the character of God, the more 
discomfort we can, when we try to give trite little formulas, you know what I mean? Little platitudes, nice little phrases. Life is complex and so is suffering. And trying to reduce God to a formula does much more harm than good. I think that's what this writer is, is getting at. The harshest language in the Bible is reserved for those who claim to speak for God, but don't. It says teachers will endure a stricter condemnation. I'm not saying that to freak anybody out. All I'm saying is this. To claim to speak on God's behalf, that's heavy. It's heavy. And we want to make sure when we come alongside someone, when we try to represent God's thoughts, would you agree with me? We want to do the best job we can of representing God accurately. Because what we say will have a lot of weight relative to if we make their burden lighter or heavier. Does that make sense? And what this guy is indicating, these kind of things that were said to the sufferers in that day, similar things that I hear today, they don't represent God accurately. Okay. Here's a point of application. We're going to stop here just for a second. Okay. A thought. Ask God to reveal himself to you. Why do I say that? Because God does want to be known. It's not that God hides. It takes time to know God. But the fact is, God does want you to know him. Has it ever occurred to you? Ask God to reveal himself to you. You see, you don't need to twist God's arm behind his back to get him to say uncle. He wants to speak himself out. He speaks himself out through creation. He speaks himself out through Christ. And he will reveal himself to you. It will take time. It always does. But he wants to do that. Back in 1985, I came to a point where, for some reason, I came to say, you know what I really want, God? I want you to reveal yourself to me. And since 1985, that's a prayer that I've prayed meaningfully just about every day. It's what I want. Have you ever thought of that? You know what? If God is who he says he is, if he's this individual who always existed, and that's hard for me to understand. There's so many things about God that are difficult for me to understand. But I want to understand him. I want to know him. And that's why just about every day I'll say, God, would you reveal yourself to me? If you don't, I don't get to know you unless you reveal yourself. And can I encourage you to do that? You say, oh, I, he really does want to tell you what he's like. And why I would say that is you say, well, I couldn't do that because he, no, he can reveal himself to you. You say, oh, but I don't. He, listen, he wants to reveal himself to you. You say, but I haven't got to say. He wants to reveal himself to you. you. Say, what do I need to do? Just do that? No, I'd say, get a Bible. Get a Bible. Um, and if you don't have a Bible, a lot of good versions, new international version of the Bible, but do this. Don't just read it to get information. Read it, and when you go into it, say, God, would you help me to get to know you? That's what I recommend. And again, we've talked before about the different things that you might do. When I'm in the Bible, what I find to be the most helpful discipline that I have ever, I'm so glad I went through the, the work to make this comfortable. I like to write now. I didn't for a long time. But what I'll do if I go into a, a portion of the Bible, I'll just find something and I'll just write it. I'll write it out in a book. And I have this hardbound books. So I have a zillion of them now. But I find that when I write out a passage of the Bible, just word for word, I'm just writing a sentence or a paragraph. As I'm writing, it really helps me think about it. And you might do that. You might get a Bible and a little notebook and a pen. And don't write for page upon page. There's a lot of things you can do in a journal. What I do in my journal, there's sometimes I write about what I'm feeling and doing. But just about every time I open a journal, I take and I write down a passage of the Bible, maybe a sentence, and then I'll just start 
thinking a little bit about what it means, maybe a paragraph or so. Most major things that I've felt have been, God, reveal yourself to me, and I've come away thinking, gosh, I think I understand you better, have been because of a Bible and thinking through a pen and a pencil. Otherwise, my thoughts just go to. <laughs> so get a Bible and seek the truth, not experiences. Seek the truth. Uh, God will reveal the truth, but the truth won't always feel like shivers up your spine. Ooh. You know, God does, I don't get that from God. You know, people say God talks to them audibly. I don't get that. Sometimes a thought hits my head, and I say, where did that come from? And I think it was God. But I don't hear audible voices. I never have. I've had impressions sometimes, but those are fairly rare. I've learned a lot of things, and it usually comes with a Bible sitting down and learning something about God. So ask God to reveal himself to you. Get a Bible and open it. You don't every day. You don't have to do it every day. If you can, great. Write a portion of it out, a sentence or two. Think about what it means. Seek the truth, not experiences. And get some help. Get some help. There's things about the Bible that will... You know, if you're in a, in a place where somebody will help you to know it, it will, it will really help. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm uncomfortable doing what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do it quick. Um, um, as relates to telling the truth of the Bible, because I'm not the only one up here doing it. Jay gets up here. Mark gets up here. Doug gets up. I will say as relates to telling the truth of the Bible, trying to accurately reflect what the Bible says and doesn't say, this is absolutely the best church that I know of. And that's, gosh, my, how proud is that? But why I'm saying this is because we really care about that. You know, there's places, there's, there's churches have a lot better ministries, <laughs> a lot better programs. I don't think there's any church I'm aware of that, that is as committed to reflecting honestly and with integrity, the truth of what the Bible says and doesn't say. We work very hard at that. It's, it's, it's a passion. It's a passion. I, it, I don't want to get up here and tell you something I don't think is true. I can't. Because this is really important. We're talking about God and God, he exists. We want to know the truth about him. And so... If you come here and that's what you, kind of where you want, you want to know the truth of God, I tell you the truth, I think you came to a great place. <laughs> okay. As the knowledge of God increases, capacity to trust him increases. Secret of trust is stop trusting God, start trusting God. <laughs> what do I mean by that? We put God into these little formulas, little itty-bitty formulas where God becomes small and puny and vindictive. And if you give God five bucks, he'll give you $100. You can reduce God to a mathematical equation. I hear that all the time. Give God $100, he'll give you 1000 Says who? God is not that predictable. He's bigger than that. And sometimes we, and that's the, the deal. Our God is so small sometimes. The God that I hear talked about that you can reduce to a five-point outline, he's bigger than that. And that's, that ends up being what Job learns. He sees God, but then because of what he goes through, he sees God. Think about it. Think about what it means to believe in God. And as I've said before, I think it's hard to believe in God. And I'm not, I'm not playing around. I do. It's much harder not to believe in God, though. Much harder. It's hard for me to believe in God because, again, to believe in God means that before take away people, see, think of the universe. Take away people. Okay? Get rid of people. Erase them. Get rid of buildings. In fact, get rid of the earth. Get rid of the planets. Get rid of all of them. Erase them. Get rid of the Milky Way and all the galaxies. Okay. Get rid of the atmosphere. Now what do you got? 
God. Where did he come from? He's always been there. There was never a time that he didn't exist. <laughs> Say what? That's what it means to believe in God, that he's uncreated, that he's always existed. Can I tell you, that's really big. <laughs> And, and that's why I would say, ask God to reveal himself to you. He existed before anything did. We, we make him this big, but God is huge. Stop trusting in God. Stop trusting in God. We hear about a God who is meek and mild, and, and Jesus was God, and Jesus did have meekness and mildness. But I'll tell you what, now God's not meek and mild. As we've said before, he's large and in charge. God is large. And in charge, he exists before anything else did, and his voice is like thunder. Revere him. Don't fear him. Don't fear him. I don't think you have to. I think God is good and strong, but deserving of reverence. He's one before whose feet we sit and say, if you don't tell me how things are, I can't guess it. I don't know it. Reveal yourself to me, and he will. He will. This is what Job learned. Look what it says. Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I didn't understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears had heard this is what Job says about God. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. He complains against God, and the writer, in addressing sufferers who might complain, has some harsh things, not harsh things, but what he'd say, stop whining. Stop whining. And look at who you're talking to. When we talk about God, we're talking about the person who created everything. And therefore, when you consider, when we consider who we're talking to, we, honesty, authenticity is what he demands, but humility and respect, not terror, but humility, respect, reverence. You tell me, God, because you know I don't know. But you do know, and I want to know. So that's humility. It's the kind of attitude that Job comes up saying, you know what, I complained a lot, but I really didn't know who I was talking to. Because now I've seen you, and having seen you, I feel stupid for saying some of the things that I said. Stop trusting God. Stop trusting God. I know in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, they talk about putting your faith in a higher power, and there's been some problems. Some people said, make it God. And I've talked to some, talked to Mark oftentimes about this, Lordson, and he said, you know, sometimes the God people have been raised to believe in that God needs to die because that God was this big. He was a God who did tit for tat. You know, he was small. He wasn't God. And that God, do you understand what I'm saying? The caricature that was communicated, this is God, was a caricature this big, needed to die. And sometimes the alcoholic, or I think many of us, are raised with a God who's small. We have to come to a place of understanding, you know what? The God, our conception of God, it needs to expand, doesn't it? That's why, here's my encouragement, okay, big thing. Ask God to reveal himself to you. Then get a Bible. Start to look at it. Don't get driven. Ask God to talk to you and reveal himself to you through it. Get some help. We're going to be doing some things, retreats that we do. You'll find and learn some things there. The one coming up in February is going to be a great retreat. We're going to do intermission coming up, which is going to be going through texts of the Bibles. We'll go through some New Testament books and some Old Testament. Come on Wednesday night, you'll learn the Bible because we're going to want you to bring a Bible. If you don't have one, we'll help you to find one, know where to get one. But when we do these things on Wednesday night, I'm going to have a Bible and so will you. And I'll say, turn to page, and we'll help you know where to go. Because we want to become comfortable with the Bible, all of us. So then you can say, God, reveal yourself to me and learn to, to come to him. I'm going to ask the um, worship team to come up. And as they're coming up, 
kind of an attitude that David came up with. Look what he says, the last verse. My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. Things too wonderful for me. That's back, listen, Job says that same thing. Uh, Surely I spoke of things I didn't understand, things too wonderful for me to know. And David talks about those things. We can't fully understand God. I don't think that's a reason not to ask him to reveal himself. But there's a humility. David said, I don't concern myself with great matters and things too wonderful for me, but I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. I like that. What David says is this. You know what? I don't understand everything about God, but I come to him, and I come to him not demanding answers from him, but I come as a child who has been weaned. I come to him as the source of everything. One to whom I say, give me, feed me, help me know. Not coming to God just as an intellectual argument or logical deduction, but as someone who is a person who cares. And that's so again, last time. Ask God to reveal himself to you. You say, how do I know? I want to know him. You know what that means? The juice and the bread. There might be questions you don't understand. There's things I don't understand about why I've experienced what I've experienced in my life. But I look at that. And you know what that tells me? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for me, will give me all good things. And that's why we do communion. When you come up here and grab the juice and the bread, God did not spare his own son. Listen to me. There's things we don't understand. Here's what we do understand. He cared about you so much, wants to be in relationship so he can reveal himself to you so much that he did not withhold his only son, but gave him up for you. And the reason he did that is to say this, there's things you, we can't know about him, but what we can know, a God who does that is a God I want to know. Do you? He wants you to know him. Sometime over the course of the, the next song, do one. Come on up. Grab the juice and the bread. As you do so, thank God for what he did that allows you to know him. And why don't you do this as one of your prayers as you're taking the juice and the bread and you're looking at indication of, of what he wants. God, would you help me to get to know you? Could you pray that? God, would you reveal yourself to me? Would you help me to know you for what you're like, big, so you can be bigger than the suffering I go through and I can come to you as one who provides for me and helps me to walk through difficult things. As you continue to try to seek God and try to figure out who he's like, um, keep coming back. We'll continue to talk about God week after week after week. If some of you are looking for, you know what, Mike, I'd like to do a little bit more. Can I suggest retreat would be a good next step to come to? I think you'd find it a very valuable experience. And then we'll be talking a little bit more about intermission. But for now, the retreat. If some of you are thinking, you know what, I'd like to take a step. I'd like to do something. Sign up for the retreat. Come along. Let me pray for us. Father, thanks for the way you want to be known by us. And the more we see you for who you are, the more comfort you bring. When we try to reduce you into little boxes, you become a burden. You don't, it, something that it feels heavy. But when we see you for what you're like, understand you're God and we can't totally know that, but you do want to reveal yourself more to us, and we really want to know you. Uh, would you help us to do that? Um, help us to understand who you are through your word. Help us to get to know you, have a relationship with you. Uh, thanks that you want to have that relationship with us, because we know it because of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.